When I was two years old, my parents bought the Baltimore Hotel in Bozeman, Montana. Built in the 1800s, it had been remodeled to 1950 standards with a bar, a lounge, big picture windows overlooking Main Street, and a phone in every room. Um, I lived in an, we lived in an apartment in the back on the main floor, but I spent a good part of my childhood hanging out in the lobby with the old men who lived there. I sat for hours on Naga Hyde couches, watching them and listening to their stories. Not your typical place to grow up. Old Red Kennelly is telling me he used to drive a stagecoach to West Yellowstone. Listening, I envision a younger Red brandishing a whip over a team of black horses. Schwack! Faster and faster he run, they run, and a coach full of wide-eyed tourists hanging on for dear life. I watch as Noah Brown climbs up a tall ladder. He is so wobbly and shaky, I'm worried he's going to fall. Not too long ago, he fell on the stairs, and he cracked his head open. I can still see the, the, the trail of blood that left its mark on the wall. Over in the corner is one-armed Johnny. He lost his arm in a logging camp in Montana. He's rocking back and forth and back and forth. I watch as he spits a wad of dark brown chewing tobacco into a spittoon three feet away. Clink, it hits and slides down into the gunk. <laughs> My mama fixes these old men Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. They file into our apartment and get a plate full of turkey, mashed potatoes, and gravy. She takes care of them, and they love her for it. When I was little, I spent weekdays at my babysitter's, soft-spoken Mickey Brandt. She, her family and her home was a haven for me. She picked me up every Sunday and took me to the Grace Baptist Church, where I learned Bible verses and sang in the choir. My mom, Jerry, ran the hotel. She hired and fired employees. She made the beds. She tended the bar. She washed the floors, and she kept the books. As an only child, I spent many hours with her at the desk counting mountains of change, ringing up sales on the cash register, and answering the switchboard. But it was often lonely and um, isolating. Sometimes I would invite friends over. We would go up to the third floor, walk out into the fire escape, dangle our feet over the edge, and sip Cokes and spy on all the people in the, in the parking lot. My friends loved to go up and down and up and down in the elevator. My house was kind of cool for my friends, but their parents were not so impressed. Beaver Cleaver's house, it was not. <laughs> Looking up from the desk, I see, a, I see a pretty woman approaching. My mom says, can I help you? And the woman, in a downcast voice, says, I'd like to rent a room for a week. She fills out the register and hands my mom a $100 bill. My mom gives her the key and asks me to help her to the, with her luggage. I pick up her overnight case and show the way to the elevator. As we're walking, I notice she has painted nails, and her high heels make a tap, tap, tap sound on the, on the tile floor. All the men in the lobby watch as we go by. While we're in the elevator, I notice that she is all dressed up. So when I get back, I ask my mom, why does she look so fancy? That's when my mom explains what a prostitute is. <laughs> She comes here once a year for a vacation, my mom says. <laughs> the smells of cigarettes and stale beer wafted over me as I push into the swinging doors, into the um, lounge, into the darker recesses of the lounge. I hear piano music, and I want to know who's playing. I listen while Donna plays a honky-tonk tune. She stops and takes a sip of beer. A man staggers over and tries to give her a big kiss. She pushes him away, and he spills his beer all over her. She's swearing and yelling, and my mom comes out from behind the bar and grabs a guy by the scruff of the neck and shoves him out the back door. Donna dabs, her, dabs herself with a napkin and sits back down and starts to play again, and I nestle back into the music. My father, Lyman, was a man's man. He was 24 years older than my mom, and he was often away fishing, hunting, and philandering. 
he, was, he called me his little sweetheart, and he was always pretty good to me. As a civil engineer and an entrepreneur, he had made and lost a few small fortunes over the years. He was college educated, but he taught my, my eighth grade educated mom how to do the bookkeeping. So Jerry took on the hotel, and, my, and Lyman played. Anyway, that's the way I remember it. But every once in a while, my parents would go out on the town. I watch my mom get dressed up. She's twisting, twisting her hair into a French roll and slipping in bobby pins to hold it. She wiggles into a girdle and clips on long silk stockings. She's looking in the mirror to make sure the seam is straight. She puts on a black dress that shows her cleavage. On go diamond rings and a mink stole. She traces her lips with red and transforms into someone I hardly know. Jerry usually wears cowgirl shirts with pointed collars and, and pearl snaps. Her gabardine pants crease down the middle, top moccasins with tiny beads that decorate them. Tonight, she looks like a movie star. Other than fishing um, and hunting and camping, my parents did not have much of a social life outside of the hotel. Jerry made friends with the people in the bar, and she was, her employees loved her, but she rarely did anything for herself. As the years rolled by, my parents began to fight and drink more often, and things really went downhill. The ashtray I gave my mom careens through the air and shatters against the wall. They are fighting and screaming at one another. My dad flings the roast with his fork and knife still in it at my mom. I run to my room, sobbing. I don't want to hear the, her, him hitting her anymore. I shiver, waiting for it to stop. In the morning, she packs our clothes in a suitcase. And I see that she's wearing dark glasses, but I can still see the bruises. Her lip is split, and her, dark, her regular glasses are cracked. We climb into a cab and go to the airport. We don't stay away very long. And when we come home, he is nice, and he, they hug but I know it will happen again, and so does she. It's below zero outside. It is so cold, the big octopus furnace in the basement is not working. My mom goes down to light the furnace and get it going again. Kaboom! All the dishes in the house shake. I run out, the wall, out into the hall, and I see a man carrying her up the stairs. I can't see, she screams. It's only soot on her glasses, thank goodness. But she's all black, and they take her to the hospital. We go see her the next day. She looks like a mummy, all covered with gauze. I watch her as she wriggle her, wriggles her fingers free so she can smoke a cigarette. Mama is never the same after the accident. She feels ugly, and her beauty is marred. Every day, she drinks all the time now. Every day when I come home, she's drunk. My dad is a traveling salesman. He's on the road. So I come home, and I make her dinner, and I go look for her in the bar. Come on, Mom. Let's go eat, I say. I, I hold her as we stagger into the, into the apartment. After we eat, I put her to bed. She wants me to sleep with her, but I don't want to. I'm really angry at her. She, she finally convinces me, and she smells bad, but I slip into the sheets next to her. She wants to smoke, and I say, no. I'm afraid she's going to let the, light the bed on fire again. She cuddles up to me, and I say, I hate you when you're drunk. She cries, and I cry. I'm looking out the window, peeling potatoes. I'm angry because she will not let me go with her. I'm, ang I'm afraid she's going to leave me with my dad. There's money in the car. I saw it the other day when we went for ice cream. I steal another look out the window. She's rifling through the glove box. See, I knew it. She's going to take that money and leave me. Damn her. Why won't she let me go with her? Pop. What's that? Now she's looking over her shoulder. Something is wrong. I walk out into the, the parking lot, and I hear a woman say, Jerry, are you OK? Reenie, run and get your dad in an ambulance. I run like the wind through the back hall, around the corner, and into the lobby. Help. My mom needs help. I wait and wait outside the apartment for the medics to come out. Finally, someone comes out. And I say, did you take my mom to the hospital? 
I, is she still in the apartment? Is she OK? And the man says, they don't take dead people to the hospital. The tears are running down my face, and I'm trying to make sense of that word. And then I remember the gun my dad keeps in the glove box. My mom is dead, and I am shivering so hard, and I can't stop. <sighs> After my mom died, my father lost the hotel, and we moved to Seattle. Over the years, he had a series of ill-fated relationships, and I had three less than ideal stepmothers. Meanwhile, I grew up, and I knew I did not want to have a life like my parents. The summer before my senior year, I met Miles Neff, <laughs> who would one day <laughs> become my husband. We had long conversations about our future. Miles was determined to go to college, but I had no idea what to do with myself. One day, Miles suggested that I become a teacher. I had been a nanny to five boys under the age of 10, and I'd been pretty good at it. Miles helped me believe in myself. Going to college became my pathway out of a difficult childhood and into a profession that was a perfect fit for me. Um, teaching became my first passion. The strong work ethic that my mother modeled kicked in, and I poured my heart and soul into becoming an educator. Each summer, spending hours with mom and dad in the beautiful um, Montana wilderness led me to love and appreciate nature. When we moved to Whidbey Island, with my family, when Miles and I and our family moved to Whidbey Island, I began raising salmon um, with the, my students at the intermediate school. Um, that sparked my second passion, which was to help salmon come back to Maxwell and Creek. Out of those efforts grew the Maxwell and Salmon Adventure and the outdoor classroom. Being involved with such committed citizens and seeing a dream come to fruition was both humbling and empowering. Finally, my mom always encouraged me to make friends. <laughs> this looks like the 50s, doesn't it? Uh, it was in spending time at my friends' homes that I first realized that family life could be different. Miles and I made a concerted effort in our married life to make and keep good friends. This network of loved ones has given our family a sense of community and support and have been incredible role models for our children. Seeing our children and now our grandchildren's lives unfold has been my life's most precious gift. I have been lucky in my life. I can't help but think that those Baltimore Hotel days didn't help uh, influence my choices uh, to make a better life. I know my story is not unique. We all have hardships we must have to deal with. The Baltimore Hotel feels like a different life now. Although my parents had serious flaws, I can see the positive influences they had on my life. My goal in telling this story is to give hope to those who feel their lives might never change. When I was a teacher and I had a student who was struggling at home, with the difficult things, I would take them out in the hall and I'd have a little talk with them. And I would say, look, I know your life is really tough right now, and I'm really sorry, but let me tell you a story. When I was a little girl, my life was really difficult. I couldn't concentrate in school, and I was sad a lot, but I learned to believe in myself, and that made a huge difference. And I found friends who believed in me, and that gave me confidence. So you hang in there and make some good friends. I never knew if my little talks made a difference, but I hoped that the child would know that they were not alone and that standing before them was proof that a different life was possible. Thank you.